I find it mildly ironic that the 13th installment of Shadow Run story time was delayed for so long. Suffice to say, real life got in the way, and I hope you don't hold it against me. So, for those who need a refresher, Emily Granger, the girlfriend of Jonathan Rees, an up-and-coming local politician, was facing death threats. When the team put some investigation to it, they found that Rees's entire cabinet, from his three assistants to his secretary and campaign advisor, were in on it. This was right before the conspirators decided to go for broke and sick a local homeless man, Red, swiftly identified as a dangerous cyber zombie, on the girl. The team rescued the girl, but Dervish got badly banged up in the process. I think it's still behind us. Emily Granger, a policy undergrad at Seattle U, had been repeating this phrase approximately once every 5 seconds for the last minute, in a half catatonic state. Earlier in the day, she had been stopping by a frat party to curry favor for her boyfriend and political partner, Jonathan Reeves. A grad student running for the local administrative coordinator position. Now she was in the fastest car in the greater Seattle sprawl, with a bloodied, cybered up orc spitting up teeth in the seat on one side of her and a pale, cold looking albino elf on the other. In front of her were a man in a clown mask and a NASCAR style crash suit and a man in a modern day ninja suit. It was rather tough to see the fourth man, as the light seemed to refract around him. A homeless man who was also a robot had crashed through the ceiling and tried to kill her. The orc had saved her. That was why he was bloody. She remembered that now. These were Shadowrunners. Shadowrunners had saved her life. Her repeated phrase switched to oh my god as she tilted forward in her center seat, hyperventilating. The man in the sinister looking clown mask glanced into his rearview mirror. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. She's going into shock. Geppetto, talk to the woman. The albino man glanced in Emily's direction and scowled. He was very handsome. However, cruelty glinted in his red eyes, and little else. She wasn't sure that she liked the albino man. Wildcard, I've got watches on the thing and it's still after us. It's running right down the damn freeway like it knows where we are. If you don't mind, I'm going to focus on keeping us all alive right now by slowing it down. The man in the clown mask cursed under his breath as the mage began making summoning gestures. How about you, dervish? The big orc responded with a growl as he injected himself with a stim from a med pack attached to the seat in front of him. I a little busy. As if prompted, the distorted, transparent man peeled back his hood. He was an elf. An elf with a friendly face. She liked this man. He held her hand. His hand was partially see-through. The material covering it was rough. She felt like she was able to think clearly with him there. Not with the others. They were bad people. She could feel it. But he was okay. He wanted her safe. Hey, Emily? My name's Sean. I need you to stick with us. Okay? You're going to be fine. Ben flinched slightly as the girl practically threw herself onto him. At least as much as she could manage through Wildcard's myriad seat belts. Wildcard yelled back to the team, over the roar of his engines as he accelerated. I think I've got a lock on some of the nodes on that thing, and it's not stopping. It doesn't have a vehicle though, that's good. I'm thinking our first choice is to get out to sea, Geppetto asked, incredulous, as a fire spirit materialized behind the car to combat the incoming cyber zombie when it followed. You know how to drive boats? And fly helicopters. Christ, chuckled Dervish, what did we ever need to d4? What indeed, said Wildcard, as he slammed down the Everett of ramp and made for the docks. Any of you have some buddies what would have a boat down here, now's the time to pull in favors. Geppetto flipped out his comlink and called up Mars. Mars. Gonna make this quick. I'm in Everett. I need a boat. There was a brief pause on the other end of the line before Mars baritone sounded over the line. Mercury's got a speedboat on Pier 15. He'll send you a temporary access number but if you break it you're paying for it. And he charges by the hour. What's the need? Escape. Mostly. Why is it always? Keep in touch. Tartarus. Geppetto clicked the clearance that appeared on his com link, marking him as a registered owner of the boat, over to Wildcard. Alright, we're due to the boat in 5 minutes, noted Wildcard. Dervish asked, and about how long will it take the zombie to catch up? I'm going by its trajectory, 7 minutes. Bend groaned, well, this is going to be a swift and stress-free turnover. The cask reached to a stop a block away from the pier. Wildcard activated the car's countermeasures and hit the release button on his safety gear. We got a 2 minute window, everyone. 
Bloody well move. Ben took Emily Granger by the shoulder and led her out of the car while Dervish set up a perimeter, now properly suited up in his mil-spec armor. As soon as everyone had their gear from the car Dervish's mil-spec armor, shotgun, and sniper rifle, Ben's toys, Geppetto's foci, and wildcard's machine gun and ballistic suit. The team began a tactical retreat toward the speedboat. There were faint destructive noise a few blocks away as the cyber zombie smashed past and over passing vehicles. As the rest of the team sprinted for the speedboat, Dervish followed them slowly, back to them, facing the docks. Eventually, the monster came into sight. Red had lost all of his rags by this point, and he wasn't a pretty sight. Every one of his extremities was a sibilim, head included. He'd clearly taken so many blows to the cyber skull that all that was left of his flesh was an awkwardly stretched, ill-fitting, and jaundiced face that seemed almost stapled to his metal skull. Somewhere beneath a titanium chest, a heart was still beating, kept alive by drug injections and electroshocks. The moment Dervish heard the scream of Willie, he opened fire. Red took three APDS rounds to the chest and didn't even slow down as he lunged for Dervish, denting Dervish's faceplate with a terrifyingly powerful blow. Go. Go. Fuck. Dervish beat the cyber zombie off of him with the butt of his shotgun as the rest of the team started the speedboat and began pulling out of the harbor. He swung his shotgun like a man possessed, alternating between shooting and melee wherever Red left him an opening. However, no matter how many rounds he unloaded into the zombie or how many times he slammed into him with his armored fists, Red kept coming, screaming back up, raining merciless blows on the already wounded dervish. Talk willy why won't you talk? Suddenly, Red seemed to stop. He looked up, his damaged cyber eyes squinting and swiveling, and then he leapt over dervish, flying towards another target. It was Emily Granger, standing on the docks, her arms spread wide, resigned, dervish screamed. What are you doing get back to the... And then one of Red's fists slammed into Emily's chest with a sickening crunch noise. Dervish. Over here. Dervish looked onto the water to see the team about 15 feet off of the docks. Emily Granger sat, unharmed but shocked, in the back, while Bend and a manifested spirit that resembled a Buddhist monk maintained some sort of spell. Geppetto yelled. They'll only maintain the illusion for so long. Dervish didn't need to be told twice. Activating his skimmer discs. He threw himself off the docks, landing on the back of the boat and causing it to dip wildly. Wildcard threw the speedboat into full throttle, powering away from the docks. From the dockyard, there was a betrayed wail of despair as the suburb zombie sped after the boat. However, by the time it could attempt to jump, the boat was already 30 feet out. Willie you know? We just started talking. Dervish yelled across the gap. I'm not Willie, the zombie projected, its vocal cords long since replaced by synthesized sound. Yes you are. You and me and all the other willies. You're not full though. You didn't end up like them. Don't leave me here Willy. Don't leave me here. Bend put a hand on Dervish's shoulder. Any idea what he's talking about, big man? Even if I did, I wouldn't want to stick around. Gun it. Any idea where we'd be safe? Dervish and Geppetto exchanged looks. Geppetto suggested. Well, one idea. You know how to get to the Vancouver Wildlife Preserve? Wildcard looked at Geppetto blankly. Of course, with a mask, it's hard not to look blankly. We're hiding out amongst the animals? Not animals, said Dervish, examining the dents in his armor, friends. As the speedboat pulled up on the beach, Wildcard took a gander at the small family of Sasquatches gesturing them in. You have to be kidding me, met them during a drug deal gone wrong, said Geppetto, smugly. I think they've got a house around here somewhere. It wasn't a house so much as a cabin with an adjoining tower built around the trees, but the Sasquatch family, five of them in total, lived in relatively good circumstances. They had wireless, a few game consoles, hot and cold running water, and a trade. All things considered they lived about as well as any of the runners, maybe a little better. One of the Sasquatches, in an apron, cooked up some ravioli for the family and their guests, Wildcard played a little bit of Miracle Shooter with the two younger Sasquatch kids. Emily became increasingly more and more weirded out as the team of hardened criminals interacted cordially with a bunch of Chewbacca's. All things considered it was a fairly pleasant night, well, until one of Ben's spy toys, a signal scanner, picked up the signal of a tactical network approaching the island, obvious against the lack of signals elsewhere on the island, we got a problem. Wildcard, you wanna throw a sniffer up? Wildcard set his internal comlink to scanning, and eventually zeroed in on incoming traffic. 
namely, instructions from Mr. Johnson, who incidentally had the same comb code as Jonathan Reeves. It was made clear that Emily Granger must be captured, such that her death can be made to look like a political killing. Well, that's one question answered. Next question they're coming in fast on a speedboat. Got a shaman, an assault rifle adept, a Malay Sammy, a rigger, and an infiltrator. How we wanna handle this? Devish groped for his sniper rifle. I'm thinking overwhelming force. Bend glanced over at Emily, who appeared to be on the verge of a panic attack. Considering she's target number one and they have an infiltrator, do you think we should find another place for her to hide? Geppetto, grinning at the prospect of an imminent fight, activated his foci. Like where? It's a forest, Bend. I'm thinking we just kill them all quickly. There was a guttural call from the father Sasquatch, as a guidance spirit appeared in the middle of the room. It resembled an ancient, wizened tree, reminiscent in some ways of an elderly man. As it drew its hands apart, a portal appeared, with a verdant, impossibly green landscape behind it. Geppetto gawked. You have got to be kidding me. Bend looked at the Sasquatch. You're a druid? The Sasquatch nodded proudly. Geppetto offered. And a powerful one at that, if he can make metaplanar portals. Well, no sense looking the gift horse in the mouth. Let's get the two of you in there, Bend. Wait, you're sending me in? And not risking her getting lost forever in the metal planes, yet. Yeah. In you go. Bend gulped, took the girl by the shoulders, and jumped into the portal. The spirit closed it behind them. Dovish, Geppetto, and Wildcard exchanged looks. Wildcard was in a full suit of ballistic SWAT armor, painted up in red and white like his mask. He clutched his highly modified Razhar, essentially a futuristic Chicago typewriter. Dervish was in his Iron Patriot suit and wielding his sniper rifle, and Geppetto, though merely in his black actioneer business line suit, was flanked by a cadre of giggling, menacing looking spirits. The father Sasquatch produced a compound bow, evidently quite keen on protecting his home. So, said Wildcard, plans? Geppetto gestured to his water spirit, an amalgamated piscine horror made of fins tentacles, eyes and scales. I'm thinking we drown them. Dervish takes potshot into the water, and you gun down everything that makes it to shore. I like this plan. The enemy running team was about 30 feet from shore when it came. A shadow in the depths, then a pair of sinister black tentacles creeping up the side of the boat, and then a loud crunch as the spirit dragged the speedboat down into the depths. As the rigger abandoned ship, he took a sniper shot square between the eyes and began floating face down out to sea. The rest of the enemy team, dog paddling in the water, suddenly realized just how fucked they were. Split, cried the shaman, as he cast a fly spell and lifted out of the water. An arrow flashed into the water and then exploded with the force of a grenade, sending their infiltrator pinwheeling out of the water, trailing blood. As the shaman fled for the air he saw a pale man in a suit flying for him like a bat out of hell, and then his head ruptured as a power bolt blasted him into oblivion. The adept and Sammy dropped their guns and swam for their lives, which didn't help the Sammy over much as another two sniper shots had him sinking like a stone, falling into the jaws of the water spirit. The panicked adept made sure, scrambling onto the sand for her life. She saw the tree line, and began sprinting, hoping to reach cover. She never made it, as a spray of automatic fire took her legs out from under her. Gasping in pain, she continued to crawl for the trees as a man in a SWAT suit and a clown mask approached her. Nothing personal, lass. Just business. The rattle of gunfire on the beach signaled the end of the team's opposition. The team converged triumphantly back at the Sasquatch's cabin. That wasn't very long at all, chuckled Wildcard. Ben's probably going to wonder why we sent him on a four minute vacation. Yet, yeah, if he hasn't already escaped to somewhere else, the weasel, smiled dervish. Come on, let's open it up. The druidic spirit nodded slowly, before opening the portal up again. And out tumbled Ben and Emily, giggling and groping at each other, buck ass naked but for hemp skirts and floral wreaths. They squirmed around on the floor, alternately tickling, kissing, and embracing each other. Ben looked up to make eye contact with his shock teammates and his normally reserved face melted into a massive ear-to-ear -ear grin. Hey, said Ben, his eyes dilated, it's my friends. Hi, friends. Emily clutched Ben into a big hug, squealing happily as she imitated Ben's voice. Hi, friends. Devish and Wildcard stared. What word the fuck? Only Geppetto understood what had happened, and buried his face in his palms. Metaplanar time dilation. God fucking damn it. It was beautiful, said Ben, spreading his arms wide. 
As beautiful as Emily. No, you're beautiful. Geppetto, wildcard, and Dervish looked between the 50-something elf and the 18-year-old girl with disbelief. Wildcard hazarded. So have you too. Uh, in the druidic meter planes, love is free, man. Dear God. Ben stood up and pulled a hemp sack out of the portal before it closed up. So, I kept, like, all my stuff, because there were, like, runners, or something? I don't even remember, it's been like half a year. It's been 5 minutes, bend, bend's eyes and focused. It has been, far out. Wildcard brought up a few AR windows. So, if you all don't mind, I'm going to send Reese's messages to Knight Errant, let them handle this mess. All in favor? Geppetto and Dervish nodded frantically as a flower fell off Ben's wreath, causing him to shed a single tear at the preciousness of life. Jonathan Rees was busted for conspiracy to murder and his thugs of attempted murder by Lieutenant Pete Fisher of Knight Errant, one of 2D's favorites within Raz Seattle. He was selected for the tip-off because of his wildly inappropriate use of violence in the field and his complete and utter corruption. Seeing Reese's teeth being beaten out of his face on live television Raz Cops was more than a little cathartic, especially for Emily Granger. Bend was about to give his life some serious thinking over, until a strange woman made of starry void appeared to him in a dream, speaking in the voice of the lover whom he had once lost to an Aztechnology raid. She encouraged him to engage in whatever acts felt right to him, to abandon society and practice what he pleased. He responded to his new mentor spirit surgings by continuing to pork a woman three and a half decades his junior, whose policy projects began taking a radically liberal environmentalist bent for some reason that no one in her class could quite figure out. He began to suspect that maybe he was a mildly hypocritical Buddhist. Wildcard, Dervish, and Geppetto had no major life-changing five-month-long meter planar experiences, and surprisingly, they began to be a little weirded out by Ben, for obvious reasons. It was another few weeks before the team got their next call from Brianna McCreary, urging them to come into the faulty bar. The team came in on a humid September day, sitting around Brianna's desk. She finally had her nexus in, behind the desk, and AR windows buzzed about her head. So, we've got three jobs in for you boys. And they all revolve around the Metroplex prison on 6th Avenue and Spring. Geppetto blinked. Are these jobs we can all do at the same time? Well... Two of them seem to be on the market as exactly opposed. Basically, one faction wants a prisoner sprung, one faction wants him kept in and is aware of the escape attempt, and one faction wants a message delivered. Huh? Wildcard fiddled around with a few AR bubbles carrying news stories, looking for info on the prison. Who are the Johnsons? Message Johnson is an ancient. I think he's got a brother behind bars, wants to give him something to help escape. I don't know the identity of the man inside for the other two Johnsons, but the one keeping him in is a yak and the one springing him out looks to be a corper. High class, too. This is probably a feeder job for later work. The team all looked at each other, and reached an accord. The ancient thing sounds a little smaller time for us. Delegated to one of your other teams, maybe a newer one, we're going to work for the corper. Very well. I'll let him know you're coming. The meet will be held tomorrow at 8 at the Purple Haze nightclub. The Purple Haze was a mid-class rock and roll nightclub, nowhere near the level of Penumbra, and miles below, say, Dante's Inferno. Considering that the Johnson was a high-level corper, the message was fairly clear. This was very lowly for him, and clearly whatever jobs awaited the team in the future from this Johnson would be more important than this one. The Johnson was a generically handsome human with striking blue eyes, wearing a navy blue suit with a matching tie. He fit the Hollywood impression of the Corp Johnson to a T. Gentlemen, sit down, sit down. I suppose you've been briefed? Yes, Mr. Johnson, said Geppetto with a grin, and we're in. Just let us know who we need to spring. Wildcard and Bend watched quizzically as an AR window popped into the space in front of them. There was a mugshot of a bloodied Japanese elf, his torso bandaged from gunshots. He glared at the camera with a frown that was more betrayed and hurt than angry. Geppetto gurgled a little. Dervish choked on his drink and began coughing loudly. The target's name is Josek Agahara, codname Trout. Shadow Run Story Time 13 End. Oh, now I have the return of Trout. Fuck, this is getting interesting. Like, you know, Trout was a little dickhead. I'm sure you guys remember Trout. He was a... Oh, I can't even remember what class he was. He was a fucking weeb anyway, so that's all that matters. But he was a dickhead. He really wasn't a fun player to be with. He was genuinely... 
yeah, he was just a bit of a cunt. But look, um, I always, I'm always, i always in favour of a good redemption arc. You know, I, do, I, I am a bit of a sucker when it comes to a good solid redemption arc. So, look, we'll just see what happens. But, like, you know, look, you're going to have to find out in the next one. And, of course, you already know this, I'm sure. Fucking have the YouTuber under the sun that says this. But, like, you know, to find out next time, you're going to have to subscribe and click the notification bell. Because I'm a bit sporadic when it comes to uploading videos. Or at least, not when it comes to uploading videos, but uploading, like, videos as part of a series. I don't really have a timetable. It just kind of happens from time to time. So, if you want to know what happens next, go and have to hit a subscribe button. It's the best way. To find out when and where it comes you know uh also um if you enjoyed some of the music that i was using in this video um check out how wave you it's my second channel and um, there i upload a lot of synthwave songs and stuff i really enjoy it and um, there's a live stream that goes on all the time uh, but like on the main channel of course something to check out i really enjoy it um i think it's a lot of like a lot of fun and like if that's what you're into, that's what you're into. I know that's what I'm into, so, look, who knows? Look, I'm rambling. I'll leave you to it. Enjoy, and let us know your speculations on Twitter. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!